in my session, navigating tomorrow the future of websites in Asia. You can come in. Uh, of AI and content proliferation. Um, this is going to be more of a high-level talk. It's going to be take you through a journey of the history of uh, the web, really, and why change is happening and why it's happening faster now uh, than ever before with the introduction of AI, and hopefully answer the question of why should you get involved in AI, and maybe give you a little uh, some ideas on how you can get involved uh, and get uh, up to speed with uh, incorporating AI into your workflows if you're not already. Uh, first, I want to say thanks to all the sponsors uh, for making this event possible. Um, yep. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm the CEO of Digital Polygon. Uh, I'm also a board member of Drupal for Gov. Uh, this is an entirely volunteer-run organization, and this event is not possible without volunteers. So if anyone's interested in joining the board or taking up a position, maybe come see me after and. Uh, plenty of stuff to do. Uh, if you want to get involved, you get some leadership experience, things like that. Um, right, so what are we talking about today? We're going to talk about the past, present, and future of websites. And uh, we'll talk about the evolution of websites over the last 30 years. We'll talk about kind of what are the expectations of websites today. And then we'll talk about uh, looking forward over the next five years and some things that you can do uh, to be ready for that. So, uh, if we really look at the evolution uh, at a really high bucket, it's really been like three phases of uh, evolution of, of technology for, for web. In the 90s, it was really static websites, uh, you know, HTML, CSS, uh, really no databases early on. Uh, everything was published, and I have content, and people can access it, and that's great. Uh, in the 2000s, we introduced the social web. And the social web uh, had this key interaction experience with users who could come in and they could uh, write comments and they could talk to each other and they could interact and content became more dynamic and more real time. Uh, and in the 2020s, uh, it's really changed into the smart web. Uh, things where we're moving, where AI is playing a big part in decision making. You've got bots making up 50% you know, of your Twitter traffic. And, uh, things that really look like it's happening by real people, but um, it, it, it's a lot of AI services and decentralization and uh, things happening to drive that interaction, uh, not all people driven. Um, if we dive in a little bit deeper, in the 90s, uh, here's some examples of what Google and Yahoo look like. Um, information was read only, again, uh, things were rapidly being published online, and uh, Having something online was enough, right? If you had content on there, someone could find it on Google, you were doing great. Um, if we move into the 2000s, like just look at the growth of the internet and web pages and uh, the explosion of what was there. So, you know, you go from uh, 45 million users and 250,000 websites to over a billion users and 80 million websites. It's a little bit harder to stand out in the 2000s than it was in 1990. I mean, there's more content, there's more competition, there's more noise, uh, and it's harder for people to find the things they're looking for. So, um, one of the ways to stand out was building user interaction and building communities uh, around platforms. And that's why you saw the, the rise of the social media platform and these things that share content, big groups, to make it easier to use. Um, and I'm sure. If you're around at this time, you would see changes to websites as well. Um, because interactions with users wasn't just about, let me get the information or read my book online. It was, uh, I want to find it fast. I want to find exactly what I'm looking for. And I don't want to have to dig through an entire book or you know, go to the library to find it. Um, modern websites are really looking for a better experience. They need to be flashy. They need to be good. They need to uh, resonate with me. Um, you know, when I go to a website and it looks like it was built in the early 2000s, I immediately discredit it, right? I'm like, okay, this isn't for me. I don't trust this security. You know, there's no way I put my credit card into this website. And uh, user expectations change. It wasn't like that in the early 2000s. It's like, oh, I can pay online. That's great. Um, so uh, just you know, keep that in mind as we're going through this, and we're talking about the rate of change. And in 2024. This is what the web traffic looks like, or the, the ecosystem looks like. 
We've got 5.35 billion users. We've got over a billion websites. And 54% of all that traffic comes through our mobile devices. So just in 24 years, the amount of adoption and change and competition and need to stand out has built industries. Like think about SEO. SEO is only, uh, I think I might have this stat in here, actually. Um, all right, let me go through this. 90% uh, of search traffic comes through Google. Uh, Google is the trillion dollar company because of the web, because of search, because of providing users with a way to sift through all of this data. SEO is a $1.8 billion market because of this content and this growth and this industry. Right? With all of this content and noise, they're building industries to stand out and uh, as adapted. I need to build better content to rank in Google so that I can, I can stand out. I mean, I need to create a thousand pages to get ranked in the number one spot in Google, hopefully not. Um, but uh, it's changing the way that we interact with our websites, what people expect us to do uh, as agencies to build those websites. Uh, and things like that. And the global e-commerce market gap is $6.3 trillion. Uh, that is insane uh, <laughs> growth for uh, you know, a 24 year time period. And uh, you know, we saw a huge boom during COVID of things moving online. And a lot of uh, this growth came during that time. I don't have the exact stats, so I'm not gonna guess, but uh, uh, huge growth in the e-commerce market cap, which means more and more people are looking to sell things online. Technology is changing. People don't want to go to stores. And it's making more opportunity for, um, for us to change the way that websites are built. Um, so let's talk about today uh, some more about what current websites, uh, websites are, are expecting. They need end-to-end -end user experiences. And some of the feature sets that are kind of the bar are high quality content, you need video, you need uh, additional content mediums for people to consume that traffic. If you're not on social, you're missing out compared to all of your competitors that are. Um, and you need strong user analytics, right? If you don't have any data powering your decision making, the chances of you being successful are very low. Um, just because other people are doing it and they have the ability to react faster to change. Uh, search and chat, and I'll talk a little bit more about chat later, um, but these are expectations from users. Um, and chat is gonna be, continue to become more and more of an expectation as things like chat GPT and OpenAI continue to push users in that dynamic behavior. Just like social is making people's attention spans lower and expecting content to be easier to find. Right, so think about the dynamics of users' expectations as these new technologies evolve, and then how that changes the way that websites pre present that content and are organized to, to provide that. Um, and lastly, security and privacy in today's world is, uh, like you have to have it or you can't even play in this space. Um, you know, privacy is a really interesting topic we won't go into, but I've talked about it in previous years with uh, the EU laws coming out and that translating to the US is kind of like five years behind. Um, and uh, I think you'll see a lot more of this coming uh, over the next couple of years. And lastly, from the experience side, accessible content, visual designs that are engaging and interactive, um, people that want boring things, uh, and personalized user experiences to give me the experience I want. Because if I come there and I don't find it, I'm going to go somewhere else that I can. So, how did we get here today? Um, a couple ways. The rapid advancement of technology is the number one driver for how this change happened, right? Um, like I said, a 24 year time span, but you know, it was 10 years from static content to some social and dynamic content. It was less time from social content to like API driven interactive experiences and you know, today we have uh, we have AI that is speeding up the rate of technology, uh, technological change, and is going to continue to drive these new solutions even faster than they did before. Um, 
you know, we also have a saturation of market and competition, right? With more competition means you need to work harder to stand out because you have to compete with more and more people. Um, you know, more competitors use more options, more options mean customers need to differentiate that experience more. It's just this endless cycle uh, that, that the market goes through. Um, and, and lastly, there's just a ton more content. And SEO built an industry on this and is continuing to pollute the internet with a bunch of fake and garbage content, right? And I'll show in a couple more slides that AI isn't helping this. Uh, and, and capitalism is also, you know, not super helping this, but, uh, you know, th there are many ways to stand out on this. And I think Google is actually doing a pretty good job, a better job of trying to promote high quality content, right? Um, they're getting good at weeding out. Uh, I think earlier this year, they actually de-indexed hundreds of thousands of sites that are deemed were AI generated content to, to clear its index um, to, to provide better results to its users. And you know what what I really want to talk about today, and I'll get into the meat of this in the next next couple slides, is AI is accelerating this change. Right? AI is doing really two things. It's the speed of technologies and tools that enter the market are coming faster. And just like, you know, no one in this room probably has to deal with uh, machine uh, uh, assembly language or OS programming, you just deal with, you know, Drupal or you deal with the web content. Like, you don't need to get low level anymore. AI is going to continue to build layers on top of the technology that makes everything faster on top of it. So that's going to continue to compound. Um, and sorry about the formatting here. The second is the impact to the user behavior. Um, I think search versus ask is going to be a huge component to the future. And if you haven't already seen it, there's a ton of chat experiences popping up all over the place, a lot of AI-driven content to build those bots. And then there's also a lot of people getting sued because the chat bot said, uh, you know, I'm going to sell you a car for a dollar. Um, and they're losing in court, actually. So everyone just be careful <laughs> uh, what you do for your customers because you know, when that company said, this chatbot can replace my customer's support team, uh, the court said, well, you said it could do it, and it could represent your company on your behalf, so, okay, you told us to sell it for a dollar, so we can. Um, so be careful there, and then, you know, it's, it's really uh, shifting buyer uh, expectations, or personas, even. Um, if you go back 10 or 15 years, the buyer for websites was IT. In today's market, it's market um, a lot of times, or it's uh, product owners, or it's HR going out and buying the agency that's going to build their websites. Um, in government, it's agencies doing a lot of the work. Um, maybe you're working with IT and InfoSec, but more likely you're working with the mission-driven organizations that are uh, putting the message out there, putting the feature out there to, to push that forward. And um, I think it's really interesting how that impacts what people expect and how we talk about it. All right, so let's go minority report style and go to uh, websites of tomorrow. Uh, I think the bar is constantly changing, or constantly moving. Um, I think we've seen this over the years, and I think we're just seeing it move faster and faster and faster as technology continues to evolve. Um, you know, you can love Elon or you can hate Elon. Uh, but, you know, I think this quote is pretty relevant. Like, we need to be careful with AI. Uh, its capabilities are far beyond what we understand. Um, and vastly more, uh, it can do more than anyone knows. Uh, and that's scary. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Elon's playing with Neuralink and stuff. We won't get into that, but uh, maybe we can talk after if you want to go into like, that rabbit hole. Um, so let's talk about what AI is doing. AI is augmenting content creation. And I said I'd get to this later. Uh, here we are. So Shopify has this uh, plugin that says, let's boost your SEO with building thousands of pages in seconds. Um, yeah, I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, but you know, it's showing what AI is capable of doing and how people are promoting it and how people are monetizing it, right? And I think uh, this is something we all need to be aware of, because even if you don't use it, person next to you might. And that means there's more content, more competition, and we need to be more stand out or be smarter about it. 
Um, AI is also augmenting user experiences. So, uh, you know, they're making experiences richer and more interactive than ever. Um, there's a lot of AI layers sitting between your content and uh, delivery networks to actually change what content is delivered to users based on the last three pages they visited. So, you know, this is happening and has been happening for a while, personalization, but the algorithms are getting smarter. It's requiring less effort from content strategists and data analysts to uh, define those segments and those conditions and do all this manually. It's, it's smart enough to do a lot of this for us. Uh, and it's kind of scary what a lot of these marketing platforms are doing with that data and, um, and, and driving that forward. I mean, I'm, yeah, check out Facebook and their documentaries and stuff. A lot of that is, is AI-driven and data-driven uh, experiences. Um, and it's also augmenting findability and customer support. Um, Maisie had a really great uh, demo of the Yukon uh, in Portland this year, if anyone checked it out. Uh, they're building some le uh, natural language processing uh, models, or using those models to uh, crawl and learn from people's content, and then provide a customized strategy to users to answer questions instead of them digging through those things. Um, and with ChatGPT, you know, there's talk about Google losing uh, some of their market share because people are asking questions instead of searching, and they just want the answers. That feedback mechanism is really important for us all to understand because when they come to our website and they don't find what they're looking for, and they can't type in a question they want to have it served up to them, they're going to get upset, right? And, and this is why you're seeing a lot more of these tools uh, come forward. Um, it's helping troubleshoot issues, it's offering contextual assistance, and it's providing code examples. And I'll get into the code stuff a little bit more. The tech you couldn't resist. Um, and it's augmenting development. So smart code assistant. How many people in this room use Copilot or some AI tool with their code? Less than I expect. Um, uh, AI is going to provide, and already does provide, some pretty amazing uh, support for developers and teams. And uh, maybe we should ask the question about content. Um, but it is a very good tool to help you move through that process when you get stuck. So if I get writer's block, maybe we'll go to ChatGPT and ask them a question to get ideas to then continue building what I'm building. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later, but uh, let's talk about some of this stuff here. So uh, autocomplete automatic code generation. I think this is supposed to be a GIF. I don't know if it's going to play. Um, See. Maybe because I downloaded this. All right, I'll optimize the code. Basically, uh, there's a little video in here. See you guys after. If you type in that comment of like build me a pre-processing hook that moves all my JavaScript to the footer, it automatically writes that code for you, right? And just like with uh, any system, your output is only as good as your input. And I'm going to get to this in a few slides, but I think. Uh, you're scared of AI doing your job, I think what's going to happen is AI is going to automate your job. Because you still need the knowledge, the, the strategy for how to phrase it, for how to get it implemented, for what to ask for. And knowing that is super important, just like knowing what to search in Google is going to determine how successful you are with finding things. Um, so some really powerful stuff here. Um, there's also something I learned about in Drupal Florida Camp that I'll bring up here, which is CodeRabbit. Uh, CodeRabbit is uh, basically a PR review tool uh, powered by AI that will go through your code base, it'll summarize what you've done, and it will actually go through your code and make recommendations uh, for best practices uh, and things like that. Um, in this case, it also built a sequence diagram. Uh, this diagram is completely AI generated that talks about how the data moved through your functions that are in this PR. Um, and this is a really powerful tool for architects who are reading code every day to review this, see the information, understand it better, and then get through their job faster. Um, so, you know, I think, again, it's going to augment our jobs. That doesn't mean an architect doesn't need to review this. It doesn't mean your dev doesn't need to look at your code. 
it, it means that it's going to catch things before they have to, which means they can scale and do more things and focus more on value uh, than you know telling you that your variable naming convention is wrong for the 23rd time. Um, things like that. Uh, and you know, it does the comments in the code too. So uh, this was just one PR, just go through the three kind of things that it did. Um, you kind of see that the information it provides is actually pretty good. Um, it's also talking to the development team uh, about how they should handle it, tagging them in it, uh, and doing some pretty cool stuff here. Um, from the Drupal standpoint, uh, I just want to throw it in here. The Drupal AI ecosystem is evolving uh, pretty well. There's an open AI module uh, for integrations that I think the has been doing a lot of work on with some others. Uh, I see that all over LinkedIn. And uh, this space is evolving quickly. Um, there's also some talk about using AI to do some stuff, say building things uh, within Drupal to make our lives easier for us to be able to focus on things that matter, not building content types for the 136th time. Um, and I think uh, this is going to continue to evolve and drive change. And you know what, what my message today is, you know, you can fight this, and if you're in the keynote yesterday, you'll know that's a bad idea, or you can embrace it, and you can move forward, and look at how we can use this to do more, and to do better. And uh, my hope is that this is going to allow us to stop doing a lot of the uh, mundane, repetitive, repetitive things uh, that are necessary, but don't necessarily provide value to customers. And let us really focus on the value delivery and the things that, that uh, uh, are gonna bring value to that customer so that we can get more done with, with less. So AI is really gonna change, or drive change faster than ever before. Um, you know, AI innovations are gonna do everything we talked about, but do it faster. They're going to uh, advance uh, more rapidly the change in technology. It means it's going to have new technology coming out faster, it's going to be easier to build, and that means you can have more competition. Um, and that's going to lead to saturations of markets, um, which means it's a lower barrier of entry. You know, far, first market mover has more advantage, but when 10 competitors come up, that's still going to take a market share. And it's going to happen faster than it had in the past, so we're going to see more and more companies fighting for the same space. Uh, in a shorter amount of time. And then, again, the content is just going to continue to get crazier. Um, more and more content, more and more junk, uh, more and more versions of things, and it's going to be even harder for us to sift through that noise. Um, I don't know if you've been on social recently, but there's a ton of AI-generated content being put out there, just like polluting your feed, uh, and some of it looks pretty real. So. Um, you know, these things are going to continue to happen, and, and yeah, think about what's going to have to change for us to get around, right? Um, and <coughs> this, uh, yeah, so I talked about those two things. AI is going to do increase the rate of technical evolution, it's going to increase the number of competitors, and it's going to increase the amount of computing content. So what do we do? Um, yeah, I could have just left hanging there, but I'll give you some ideas on how we can, uh, how we can work on this. So um, I really love Amir's quote here. Uh, AI is not a replacement for humans. It's about amplifying human potential. And this is what I believe the future of AI is going to be. At least let's go with the next five or 10 years and ignore the singularity event that may happen. Um, AI doesn't make this magic, right? It'll accelerate the pace of things getting done, or the content or technology. Uh, it'll accelerate uh, or decrease the complexity of solutions, right? Because now I can ask, tell, like, write in a comment that's going to run my code. That, that becomes less complex when I have the answer right in front of me. I don't need to go Google it or you know, go back to my textbooks and figure out what's going on. Um, and it's also going to augment the team, enabling it uh, to do more and keep up with all of this change. Because as more social media platforms come out, marketers have to deal with more and more things, um, or organizations have to deal with more and more things, um, or as user expectation changes, mission driven organizations need to cater to them in more and more ways. Whether that's uh, you know, putting out forms and trying to outreach to communities on social platforms, 
um, or whether that's uh, trying to do fundraising for a nonprofit to further their mission. Just having a website, having that isn't enough anymore because your competitors or other places that want donations or drive that mission are, are taking up that mental capacity, that space where those users are. Um, AI is not going to be a replacement for, for humans completely in the process, uh, at least if you care about quality. I'll go back to the car example again. Uh, you know, I think it's garbage in, garbage out. Right? If you can't put in good information, you're not going to get good information out. And I think that's really important for us to, to remember. Um, and it's not going to be a magic bullet to do everything uh, that you do now. And uh, I think there's a couple things that we can do to stay from this. I think the first one is investing in your content. Uh, content is the one thing that you have to talk about your brand, to talk about your messaging, uh, to talk about uh, who you are and differentiate you in that market and talk about the thought leadership that you have that is different than everything else out there and that's going to help you rank more highly and that's going to help you continue to uh, evolve your brand. It's also going to be better for you know quality for chatbots and things like that. Um, OpenAI hasn't released how they rank their content or how they give you a result um, but it makes sense that uh, they're going to use the same authority rankings as Google on what a reputable site is, right? High doing authority, a lot of link backs, um, which means those, those are key elements that say that this is good content if there's a lot of people linking to it, there's a lot of people talking about it, there's a lot of people going there. Um, and you know, I think that's where it's going to start, we'll see where it goes. And the second thing you do is invest in your people. Um, I think organizations need to be really careful about believing that AI is just going to replace people and I get rid of half of my staff to uh, just go with an AI bot to do that. I'm not saying that AI isn't going to speed things up and make you need less people at times, uh, but in most cases it's going to augment your team and let them do more things. And you know, leverage that time for more value-driven uh, opportunities that hopefully will help you grow your business faster and stand out from your competition. Um, and last, right, I guess I got two more. Uh, invest in your data. Um, data power is good decision-making. And that's true for you as a human, that's true for AI as a, as a, a bot, right? It needs good inputs to give good outputs. Um, there's a lot of good uh, data platforms out there um, here's some examples of uh, some data collection engines and personalization engines that use uh, that data to provide customized experiences. And all of these players are dabbling in how AI is going to power uh, those things in the future to make it easier for you. Um, and last thing, invest in your brands. I think uh, we're seeing a lot of shift here in you know, whether or not Google is or the cookies, I guess, is going back and forth, it sounds like they're not going to do that anymore. Uh, but if we invest in our uh, brand experiences, I think we can build that trust with the user base and we can uh, you know, stand out and get more of that loyalty. I think there's a time in the evolution of the internet where it went from building places that people come and build that experience because you want them to connect with your brand and keep coming back to I've got enough access to information and data that I don't care if they come back, I'm just going to keep learning with new, 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 new people. And uh, I think we're going to see that potential switch back, switch back the other way as privacy becomes more important and trust becomes more important uh, for users. And you know, AI is going to be a big factor in people not trusting things, right? Not trusting what I'm seeing, not trusting what I'm hearing, um, and uh, you know that. That brand trust is a way that they know that this is good content. Um, and I think there's brands that do that really well right now. Um, some stats here, uh, but that's really it for today. Um, you know, I'm also uh, supporting the Drupal Star Shot track. If you guys can take a survey if you're interested in SEO or have any feedback on what Drupal does well and doesn't do well, this is my one short plug uh, for this. Uh, it ends on Friday or tomorrow, so basically we'll take all the feedback 
Uh, we're going to build a track that will be published for here's what we plan to do for Starshot for an SEO out of the box experience. Um, and you know, if there's any confusion, the recipes that go into Drupal CMS can also be used outside of that in Drupal Core or current projects. And there's going to be a lot of work going into an existing modules to make them better to support this. Um, so, uh, yeah, love the feedback. Open up for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking that the industry was like uh, early 2000s and then web movement happened. But I'm curious to kind of compare it to the like, AI and how um, spaces now like, are kind of leaning towards there and some other maybe um, responsibilities that can buy it out. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, with AI coming, what do we see as the trends with people getting laid off and the market right now, similar to what happened in 2000 with dot com boom? Um, you know, I've only got speculation. Uh, I think the market right now is rough across the board. Um, I think it typically is in, for the U.S. political election years. There's a lot of uncertainty and fear. Um, I think you know, AI is making things easier. It's it's changing some things, but uh, it's still kind of the wild west. And I think there's a lot of organizations looking for AI engineers and people with AI experience because they can do tasks faster. So my recommendation to everyone in this room is start playing with AI in some way or another, whether that's going to chat GPT and asking questions or uh, asking for ideas, or that's you know maybe taking uh, Copilot or one of the open source ones that doesn't go back to Microsoft or any other program, just to self host the versions that you can install in your local environments and play around with it. Um, and just get some experience with it. Um, see what it can do and maybe take it back to your works and, and see how that can play. Um, I think it is a, it's going to be a key attribute for interviews, if it's not already, uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, because you'll be able to do a lot more than you can without it. Um, and it doesn't mean it's going to like replace you, but it's a skill set that we all need to, to take seriously and learn to give us some kind of direction. Yeah. yeah, so the, the, the question is, chat GPT uh, sounds like it gives your information away. And what was the name of the other one? Venice AI. Uh, yeah, so privacy is a huge concern in the AI space. Uh, OpenAI's privacy policies last time I looked didn't really say what they do with their data, and it doesn't restrict what they can do with it uh, in a meaningful way. So, um, you know, for, for my organization, when we use ChatGPT for AI, we don't put any customer information in it. Um, we ask it for ideas, we probably should find something more broad, um, and then take that information and tailor it if we need to. Um, you should always check with your customers and if they're comfortable with this, how sensitive is the information and things like that. I, I haven't played around with NSAI yet, uh, but you know, there's, there's you know, Google has Gemini, uh, there's something called Monica, uh, there's a lot of these other ones popping up and uh, I think do your due diligence when you really dive into that because uh, yeah, you don't want to inadvertently push that information out. Um, so it, it is a wild west. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there is the AI that you can download, and there's some of the code syntax stuff that you can download as well on your local and run it in a VM. And then, you know, companies like Macy uh, are building, you know, uh, Kubernetes clusters to run AI LLMs in cloud environments that. Uh, are built on open source models, but you control the data, and you control that. So, um, you know, there's a cost, obviously, to investing in your own AI and, and driving that forward, but 
It's not like you have to spend millions of dollars. You can use these pre-programmed models, including uh, GPT-4, which is the same thing OpenAI uses. Um, but you can spin that up on your own hardware and build an interface for it. It's a little bit more work, obviously, but um, you know, if you're if you're serious about the data uh, issues, you know, I, there's a lot of organizations like that and things like that. Go ahead, here. There are tools in Rogue that kind of aggregate the different chatbots into a single UI. And I'm wondering if there's anything to deal with that privacy question for a company to mitigate the PII or other. Yeah. Uh, I think if you built a product that mitigated that, I think you would have a very good business model. Uh, I haven't seen anything for it at this, at this time. Like, I've seen a lot of the aggregators, but nothing that, that goes as far as sanitizing content or privacy. Um, so, probably the opportunity there. Sorry, go there. Yeah. So, you talked about how the quality of your content is there. And you also talked about how the bots are looking for. Is there any mechanism by which you can watermark the content that you need to show the generator of So, there's no standard that I'm aware of to like watermark your content outside of it being on your domain. Um, I think Google and there's, there's a lot of, uh, I don't remember the site, there's just websites out there that you can paste content into and it will give you a probability if it's was AI generated or not. Um, and it's actually pretty, pretty good um, at, at deciphering that. And those are the kind of tools that Google is using when installing content to determine that. I think as more and more content is built using AI, like maybe this gets, like falters, um, and, and maybe it's harder to tell, uh, just because everything has some level of impact on it, or there's just so much content out there, it's hard to differentiate what's unique. Um, but uh, again, I think the website domain, the number of link backs you have, basically your SEO strategy is gonna inform uh, the quality of your content for AI just like it does for search. Um, it doesn't make sense for OpenAI to make up some whole new model of how valid things are when the Google model works so well. Um, not saying it won't change, but right now I think the, the way to get picked up and have good results in chat for AI is the same uh, behaviors to get ranked well in Google. Um, providing the high quality content that could use your experience, you know, high performing sites, things like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for individual sites and like internal site search, do you have any uh, tools or approaches to recommend sort of start changing that? Yeah, um, the best demo I've seen was at LoopyCon, and it's the stuff that Amazing was working on, prototyping out. Um, I don't know, I'm sure there's other like out-of-the-box tools to do it. There was uh, another tool we looked at, uh, Agolia? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Amazie is doing a lot of custom LLM search bot training on your own content. Amazie.io. They're a, a triple web hosting company, but they're getting more and more into the AI space for like self hosted LLMs um, and building search experiences. They've got a couple of prototypes for that uh, that I think we're going to definitely for. So, definitely, they're, they're super willing to talk to people about it, so I definitely recommend that if you're interested. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, I think that AI is probably the search engine I've seen. Um, haven't used it yet, I'm just exploring it, but I've heard good things. Um, so those are the two that come to mind. Uh, sure, come back. Yeah, download the, the, the OpenAI module and uh, get the API key from OpenAI. That's a good way to get started.
from one of their government beds. Um, so AI yeah, probably is helping with that. Uh, that's, that's hard. Uh, but you're right, it, it does. It helps you organize the content to match the RFP. And I think uh, it can help us continue to evolve that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't do that. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely.